Welcome, everyone. Today, we're focusing on something vital for many of you listening, haloperidol. That's right. Specifically, those nagging concerns about cardiac safety. Is it really as risky as we've sometimes thought? Exactly. Our mission here is simple. Give you, our fellow healthcare providers, a clear evidence-based picture of its safety profile. We're digging into the latest, most solid research. And the core of that research is a major meta-analysis uh, published in PLOS 1, June 25, 2025. A meta-analysis. So really strong evidence then. Absolutely. Yeah. This kind of study, pulling together data from lots of randomized trials, it sits right at the top gives us a much more reliable view than any single study could. It's powerful stuff. Okay, powerful stuff indeed. So let's get into it. What exactly did this meta-analysis set out to investigate about haloperidol and the heart? Well, they structured it really well using the PICO framework, you know, mm -hmm. standard for asking clear clinical questions. Patient, intervention, comparison, outcome. Let's break that down. Sounds good. Each part is pretty crucial to understanding just how strong these findings are. Okay, let's start with P. The patients or the population. Who was actually included in this analysis? Must have been quite a few people. Oh, absolutely. For P, we're talking about roughly 12,000 patients. A huge number. 12,000, wow. Yeah, and what's really impressive is the diversity. These weren't just one type of patient. Right, what kind of settings? All sorts, psychiatric units, substance abuse treatment centers, um, critical care like ICUs, patients with dementia, various neurological conditions, even people around the time of surgery, perioperative settings. So really broad. That helps with generalizability, I imagine. Massively. Mm -hmm. It means the results aren't just confined to one specific niche. And crucially, about a third of these 12,000 patients already had known cardiac comorbidities. Okay, so people with existing heart problems were included. That's important for real-world practice. Exactly. It makes the findings much more relevant for the kinds of complex patients you often encounter. Okay, that covers the patients. Moving to ICU, the intervention. Straightforward, I guess. Yes. The I was haloperidol administration. And they didn't limit it. Uh, they looked at different routes. Intravenous, intramuscular, and oral. All the common ways we give it. Good. Yeah. So the analysis covered the spectrum which again, boosts the applicability of the results. No stone left unturned there. Right, so haloperidol given in various ways, how was its safety assessed? What about the C and O comparison and outcome? Okay, so see the comparison. Haloperidol was compared against either placebo. The gold standard baseline. Right, or against what they called active comparators, so other medications. This helps isolate haloperidol's specific impact. Got it, and O, the outcome. What were they measuring? The main focus was major adverse cardiac events. It included death from any cause, cardiac arrest, and ventricular arrhythmia. Like VTAT or VFib. Exactly. And importantly, they specifically included torsades at the point in that category, plus seizure or syncope. So serious, clinically significant events. Definitely. And they had a particular interest in overall mortality and arrhythmias, given, you know, all the historical baggage around heloperidol and the heart's electrical activity. OK, thank you for laying out that methodology so clearly. That really sets the stage. So the big question, what were the findings? This huge study, 84 trials, 12,000 patients. Did haloperidol increase cardiac risk? This is really the crux of it. And the answer was remarkably clear. Haloperidol administration was not associated with an excess risk for Macy. Not associated, so no increased risk. Correct. No increased risk for death, cardiac arrest, ventricular arrhythmia, any of those defined AD outcomes compared to either placebo or those active comparators. That's quite a statement. It really pushes back against long-held fears. It does. It suggests that maybe our perception of its cardiac danger has been perhaps somewhat inflated based on older data or case reports. What about intravenous haloperidol? That's often seen as the riskiest route. Did the route of administration make a difference in this analysis? That's a really critical question, and they looked at it directly. The analysis found that intravenous haloperidol did not lead to increased mortality compared to intramuscular or oral routes. No difference between IV and the others for mortality. No difference found in this large data set, which is quite reassuring considering how often IV is used in acute settings. Definitely. Did they find any specific groups who were at higher risk, like older patients or those with heart conditions? Another good point. They specifically searched for at-risk subgroups. They looked at age, sex, the different patient populations, psychiatric, ICU, etc., and they found none. No specific group showed higher risk? No. Haloperidol didn't seem to pose an elevated MBE risk for any particular demographic or clinical group studied, even those with baseline cardiac comorbidities. 
It really strengthens the overall safety picture. That is incredibly reassuring. But what about those specific arrhythmias we always worry about, like torsades de point? Even if aim overall wasn't increased, were those specific events still a concern? This is where the numbers really provide perspective. Arrhythmic events overall, things like VTACH, VFib, were extremely rare. How rare? They occurred in only 0.2% of all cases studied. That's what, two people out of every thousand? Very infrequent? Okay, 0.2%. And torsades specifically, the one everyone cites. Even rarer. Torsades de points has occurred in only 0.02% of cases. 0.02%. Two cases per 10,000 patients. It was described as vanishingly rare. These numbers really help quantify that risk, showing just how infrequent these feared events actually are in the context of broad heliparital use. Wow. 0.02%. That really puts it into perspective. These findings seem pretty groundbreaking. You mentioned it's a meta-analysis of 84 randomized controlled trials. Can you just emphasize again why that makes the evidence so strong? Absolutely. The strength comes from combining all those individual studies. 84 randomized controlled trials. That's a huge amount of data. And randomized trials are already a high level of evidence on their own, right? Exactly. By pooling them, you dramatically increase the statistical power. This means the results are much less likely to be just random chance. You get a more stable, reliable estimate of the true effect. And it helps with applying the findings more broadly. Precisely. It increases the generalizability. Because the data comes from different settings, different specific protocols, different patient groups, the overall finding is more likely to hold true across the board. And that massive sample size, 12,000 patients, that's key too, especially for looking at rare things. Ooh, absolutely essential. When you're looking for rare events like torsades, you need a large sample size to detect them accurately, or, just as importantly, to confidently say they don't happen often. A smaller study might just miss them by chance. Or potentially overestimate their frequency. This large data set gives us much higher confidence in the findings, especially regarding those rare but serious events. And again, including patients with known cardiac issues, makes it directly applicable to the higher-risk individuals we often treat. Okay, it sounds incredibly robust, but as always in research, were there any limitations healthcare providers should be aware of when thinking about this study? That's fair. No study is perfect, even a large meta-analysis. One point is the detail on individual study quality. Meaning? Well, while they were all randomized trials, the meta-analysis itself didn't provide a deep dive into, say, how well the randomization was concealed or how effective blinding was in each of those 84 studies. So some individual studies might have been better quality than others. Potentially. Yeah. While pooling data often washes out minor flaws from individual studies, it's something to keep in the back of your mind. The overall strength is still very high, though. Okay. What else? Another point is the active comparators. The study grouped them together, but it wasn't specified exactly which other drugs haloperidol was compared against in all those trials. Ah, so the comparison group wasn't uniform across all studies. Right. If there was a very wide mix of comparators with different safety profiles themselves, it could theoretically introduce some variability, some heterogeneity. It likely doesn't change the main finding, but it's a nuance. And what about the rarity of the events themselves? You said torsades was 0.02%. Could that rarity itself be a sort of limitation? It's more of a statistical consideration, perhaps. Mm -hmm. Finding events that rare means that even with 12,000 patients, you can't say with absolute 100% certainty that the risk is zero. To definitively rule out extremely, extremely rare events might need even larger data sets or specifically designed studies. But the practical takeaway is still that the risk is incredibly low. Overwhelmingly low, yes. The finding strongly supported safety. It's just acknowledging the limits of certainty when dealing with things that almost never happen. Understood. So given these really strong findings, despite those minor limitations, what are the practical take-home messages for us healthcare providers? What changes tomorrow in clinic or on the ward? I think the main clinical implication is quite profound. That long-held, deep-seated concern about QT prolongation and serious cardiac events with haloperidol. This evidence suggests it might be, well, significantly overblown. So we can perhaps relax a bit about that specific risk. I think this data gives us permission to. It supports a fundamental reevaluation of how strictly we need to police its cardiac effects. It's potentially a big shift in perspective. What does that mean for things like ECG monitoring? Getting a baseline follow-ups that can be cumbersome. This is a major practical point. The findings strongly suggest that haloperidol can be used safely across this wide range of patients, including those with cardiac issues, without needing routine ECG monitoring. 
no routine ECGs. That would save a lot of time and resources. Absolutely. It allows for a more evidence-based practical approach. We can prioritize treating the patient's acute agitation or delirium rather than potentially delaying care for ECGs based on a level of concern that this data doesn't seem to support. It's about judicious use based on actual risk. So it sounds like this research really validates haloperidol's place in our toolkit, especially for those difficult situations. It really does. The fact that harms were so rare, even in this huge data set covering diverse, often complex patients, confirms its value for delirium, for behavioral emergencies, it remains a vital tool. And we can use it with more confidence now regarding cardiac safety? Precisely. Greater confidence, potentially fewer unnecessary monitoring hurdles, allowing us to focus clinical attention where it's most needed. It's about optimizing care using the best evidence we have. Okay, fantastic. So, to wrap this up for everyone listening, the core message seems pretty clear. It is. Based on this very strong meta-analysis, haloperidol's cardiac risk appears far lower than many of us were perhaps taught or have perceived. This updated understanding can genuinely impact your clinical decisions, hopefully making things more efficient and still very safe for your patients. Think about how this might change your approach.